Hello, good evening. This is Vernon, and this evening we're continuing our series, A Date with Destiny. Tonight's topic is the gleams of the golden morning. Please join me as we have a word of prayer to begin our study for this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we do have to come together once more. To history right now and at present we see that we are told and we have been warned that the present is a time of concern to everyone living and even though everyone living is not concerned about it they should be and so I ask you father that as we study tonight that the messages the thoughts everything expressed will be a source of warning of waking up but most importantly a source of of encouragement to all the listeners. Father, I pray that you will be with those of us who are here on the line and on the internet listening, and that tonight there will be no distractions, there will be no hindrances to take our minds off of the study. I ask you to be with everyone who is listening now and who will be listening throughout the course of the study, and that you will bless your words to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In our study this evening is entitled, A Date with Destiny. This is part three, Gleams of the Golden Morning. In part one, we looked at Christ, the way of life, showing how he was indeed, and is indeed, not just the best way, not only, not only the way, but he is the way to life. And then, Last week, we looked at the sinking sands of time, showing how rapid that this world's history is coming close, it's coming real close to its finale. And so tonight, part three, we're looking at signs that are telling us just how close we are to the events. So as we listen, I pray that you will take notes, record, memorize, but most importantly, it is the prayer of my heart that you do what we are going to talk about at the conclusion. Prepare. widespread apprehension about the future and we're talking about from the intensity that has taken possession of every earthly element and you recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. The calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of war are potentious. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. 
The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones. Those final movements are what we'll be looking at this evening. But before that, let us examine movements that took place before. And by that, I'm talking about right towards what we're calling the end of time. And in our introduction it says, this evening we will not so much focus on the far too long study of the prophetic time period that covers Christ's end time prophecies, which are recorded in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 12 and 21. It says, we'll be looking at most events, at most of the events close to our time, but some historical background is needed. And for those of us who are students of prophecy, a lot of this will be easily understood. But for many others who will be listening to this, this new information. Okay, so this week, and we'll talk about this later on, this week here in America we know that the Pope is visiting the United States and he is going to be addressing a joint session, Congress, the House, and the Senate. And the question naturally arises, why would people be concerned about that? Why would that be so much of an important event? And normally, we say no, but based on what we talked about last week, where the signs of time are just being ripped out of the top part of the hourglass, just dropping to the bottom, that's exactly what we're seeing taking place now. History is coming to its conclusion, and like the Bible predicts, it tells us that the days will be cut short, that for the elect's sake, and it says a short work will the Lord make. God is indeed doing just that, as the Bible predicted. We'll see, like we just read, events taking place, bringing people together. Everyone is uniting, forming enemies, becoming friends. And these things are not alarming many people because they have this ostrich in the sand mentality. Even though they should be aware of what's going on, they're not. And again, the Bible predicts all of this will happen. Scoffers and people neglecting to study and on and on. And so they don't realize what's going on. But we have to be clear as students of prophecy. We have to understand these things if we're ever hopeful of standing firm during the last tribulation. Okay, so a few important historical events in light of the papal visit this week to the United States. So the rise of the papacy took place in 538 AD, and if you know history, you'll know that after the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 AD, when the empire was divided, it was divided up into 10 different kingdoms. Three of those kingdoms were not appreciative of what took place, and by that I mean the Roman Caesar, he gave the western half of the empire, starting with the capital being in Italy, to the papacy, to the church, and he went off into the east, and that's how it was for those several years. But then, after the fall of Rome, the bishop of Rome, the leader of the Western Roman Empire, he started to consolidate his power, and there were seven other nations came under him, but there was three places, three kingdoms, that said, no, we will not listen to this, we will not submit to you. And so what happened? In 538, after several years, beginning around 533, the French king, Charlemagne, some of us may know him from history, he helped the papacy conquer those three nations, nations that were never again mentioned in history. So that was 538 at the start of the papacy. 
Why is that important? Because history again is coming together to show that this rise of the papacy is taking place now where it's being brought back to the place that it was. But notice, the Bible also talked about not just the rise of the papal power, but the fall of it in Revelation 13, where it said that you received a deadly wound. And that brings us down to the year 1798, when the Emperor of France, Napoleon, took the Pope that was reigning at that time captive. Then he used the word reigning because that's how they were. They were actually the ones who were dominating not just religious affairs, but political affairs for, as the Bible again predicted, 1,260 years. Another important historical event from 1793 to 1796, what you saw, what happened in France as, what happened in France was seen as where they threw off the shackles of the papacy, but from 1793 to 1796, three and a half years in that time frame again, as the Bible predicted it would, Revelation 11. What became known as the French Revolution, the Reign of Terror, where the Bibles were outlawed, that reason was exalted as the reigning power, and atheism became the official national stance. God, for the first time in any nation's history, was excluded. Official law of the land was there is no God. And what happened here during that time was also a direct contributor to events taking place in our world today where people are saying there's no God and atheism and godlessness is just running roughshod in society. So it's important for us to understand history as we always told that those who have at history are doomed to repeat it. For students of prophecy and history, you are aware of events that take place during the past 2,000 years that fulfilled Christ's prophecies in Matthew 24, 13, Mark 13, and Luke 12 and 21. The signs Jesus told about indicating end times happened exactly as he said after the great tribulation period of the Middle Ages. That's something else that needs to be added to the equation. Yes, indeed. From 538 to 1798, roughly between the year, the papacy began to persecute Christians who did not go along with his systems. And so from that time, the early ages, you had groups like the Waldenses, the Albigenses, and other groups, the Huguenots, on and on and on, until you had it going down to the time of the Reformation, we have Tyndale and Wycliffe and Hudson Jerome, ultimately up to Martin Luther and later on. But during all that time, because they did not like the dissenters, because they did not want to have any consenting voice on dissenting voices, they persecuted Christians who, because of their conscience, refused to go along with anything that had to do with the papacy, they saw it. And all throughout the Reformation, all the reformers saw the papacy as the Antichrist power of Revelation 13. And they knew this. So there was a great tribulation and more Christians were slaughtered, like I said last week, more Christians were slaughtered under Christian Christianity, in the name of Christianity than before during the time of when the Caesars were ruling the Roman Empire. And so in Luke 21, we read it, it says, And there shall be signs, verse 25, in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Right? Okay, and so we know that Christ said immediately after the tribulation of those days, what will happen? The sun will not shine.
not shining all around the world. And here in the United States, it was cataloged in Congress that they were meeting, and you had the men who were meeting at the time were afraid and said, this is the end of the world. They lit a candle, and instead of having regular Congress sessions, they had church in the Congress. And then, in 1833, you had what is called the falling of the stars. And again, this was an historical fact. People looked up and they saw meteors, and that's what Christ meant when he said that stars falling. That great meteoric shower that was seen all over the world. And like Christ put it, like fakes being shot out. This week we have a quote coming to the United States. And for some, for most, it's not an unusual event. Because most people, when they see that, they look at him and they view him, you know, not really as a threat, not really as something like a, like, to put out. Leader of the world's two billion plus Catholics, but the leader of his own country, the Vatican. Okay, and I'm pretty sure that it's going to be staged as that. And all of that, you know, we would have set up alarm bells, right? But like I said, things are coming together. And so, if from early on you're able to put two and two together, then you go after a while. You know, it's all as after four. And so when you see all these things taking place, all these changes happening, it makes you begin to wonder what is really going on, what is really happening. The Bible predicted the rise of the papacy back to universal power. And in Revelation 13, 1 to 18, we can see that rise. If you knew about the plans that are being worked out while many of us are sleeping, my friends, it will shock us wide awake. Seriously. For those of you who probably are aware of some of the prophecies and the fulfillment that have been taking place, we know that a great majority of it started to happen as far back as 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall and that was an indication you know, that things were about to go down and history took on a more rapid pace I could say and I would say after that where the sinking signs of time began to sink faster and after 89 with the reunion of Germany you have all these different nations being rewritten. These former empires being broken up. And now what you have is many nation states coming after that. A lot of the dictators were toppled. And all of this as prophesied because what is getting ready to take place is a conglomerate of united nations coming together as one. And we see that taking place actually right now. If you were to look at the unions that they have, they have the South Asian Union, they have the North American Union, they have the South American Union, they have different unions of different states, the European Union, all the states that came together. But the Bible tells us that one day, they all would come together as one, and for one purpose, to persecute the people of God. The topic of our study tonight, the gleams of the golden morning. So when we see all these things taking place, right, it's not to scare us, it's not to frighten us, but it's to give us hope that the morning that we've been waiting for is approaching. And I got the title from one of my favorite songs, and I just want to share the lyrics with us before we go on. It says, the golden morning is fast approaching. Jesus soon will come to take his faithful and happy children to their promised home. The gospel summons will soon be carried to the nations round. The bridegroom then will cease to tarry and the trumpet sound. Attended by all of the shining angels down the flaming sky, the judge will come and will take his people 
where they will not die. There, those loved ones who have long been parted will all meet that day. The tears of those who are broken hearted will be wiped away. And the cross says, Oh, we see the gleams of the golden morning piercing through this night of gloom. Oh, we see the gleams of the golden morning So we begin reading from the book, Last Day Friends. It says, Signs in the Heavens. At the close of the great papal persecution, which we talked about in the 1780s, that's actually when it came to a close, a few short time before it was the end of the 1,260 years, Christ declared the sun should be darkened and the moon should not give her light. Next, the stars should fall from heaven. And he says, Learn a parable of victory. When this branch is yet tender and put its foot leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, you know, when you shall see all these things, know that he is near, even at the door. Christ has given signs of his coming. He declares that we may know when he is near, even at the doors. The generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. These signs have appeared. In other words, what we talked about earlier, the Lisbon earthquake, the great dark day, and the falling of the stars. Now we know of a surety that the Lord's coming is at hand. But there were signs in the heavens. But Jesus also talked about signs on the earth. He said, there shall be signs in the sun and moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations. And he gave references like Luke 21, 25, which we read, Matthew 24, 29, Mark 13, 24 to 26, and Revelation 6, 12 to 17. Those who behold these harbingers of his coming are to know that it is near, even at the door. Matthew 24, 33. And so when we see all these things taking place around us, calamities, and I mean, if you really took the time, the listeners, events that will take place in the future and so the people don't know. The nations are in unrest. Times of perplexities are upon us. Men's hearts are filling them for fear of the things that are coming upon the earth. But those who believe in God will hear his voice amid the storm saying, It is I, be not afraid. Again, gleams of the golden morning. When we think that these things will make us feel like hopeless or desperate or cry out like, God, I need more time. I'm not ready yet. He's saying to us that I'm on the way. Get ready. These are my markers letting us know that Jesus is coming soon. Notice what it says also, Strange and eventful history is being recorded in the books of heaven. Events which it was declared should shortly precede the great day of God. Everything in the world is in an unsettled state. True enough. And that's one thing that we definitely need to look at tonight. Earlier this, well, last week, thought came to my mind that you know how we always talk about we need to be daily momently on guard because we never know what could happen tomorrow that you could be here today gone tomorrow the fact is like I said you could be here today and gone 
today. That's just how chaotic society is. I mean, let's look back in history, not too far history. People were in a couple of tall buildings, and next thing you know, they were dead or injured. You know, and all over the world, things are happening. You could be devastated by an earthquake out of the blue, and all these storms and hurricanes that have been raging over the past several years. It's a true statement. Things are being chaotic. But guess what? It's even worse. In the hearts of men, it is getting chaotic. You know how the Bible says in Revelation 6 that when mankind sees these things happening, something that's even prevalent in the Christian community. Take for instance, they have already saturated the Christian community with the idea of the prosperity gospel. You know, you live here and you have the best thing, the biggest that, and the company line is there's nothing wrong with having this and nothing wrong with having that and true on the surface you'll be right but here's the thing they don't have these things because they've been blessed with those things the sad truth is it's because they worked to accumulate those things because they wanted to have status I heard a story not too long about this one lady who was going through a hard time. She was rich and she had whether to get rid of her house or get rid of her Mercedes Benz. Because she wanted to have a persona in church that she had it all together, she got rid of her house and lived in her Mercedes Benz. That's a church girl. So could you imagine people in the world, the status that they want to maintain? So when they're told that everything in the world is in an unsettled state, it even means the hearts of human beings. They don't understand and they don't get what is going on right now. But those of us who are studying prophecies, we should know. Our reading goes on to say that one of the signs of Jerusalem's destruction, Christ has said, Many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Matthew 24, 11. False prophets did rise, deceiving the people and leading great numbers into the desert. Magicians and sorcerers claiming miraculous power drew the people after them into the mountainsides. But this prophecy was spoken also for the last days, our day. This sign is given as a sign of the second advent. We shall encounter false claims, false prophets will arise. There will be false dreams and false visions, but preach the word, be not drawn away from the voice of God in his word. And the writer says, I have been shown many who will claim to be especially taught of God and will attempt to lead others and from mistaken ideas of duty they will
good things happening. associate those bad things with the gleams of the golden morning. But like the sun said, we, we see when these things happen that Jesus says to us, which is our scripture, theme scripture for today, in Luke 21, verse 28, it says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head for your redemption. Draw at night. Luke 21, 28. And that's what we should be doing right now. But we have people running around telling Christians here. And due to the tribulation that's coming up ahead, God has already promised us, Isaiah 33, 15 and 16, that he'll provide for us. He tells us that our bread and water shall be sure. And in Revelation, it tells us the same thing, that God's children will be fed. We don't have to worry about that. We are not now able to describe with accuracy the scenes to be enacted in our world in the future. But this we do know, that this is a time when we must watch unto prayer. And that's what I'm saying. Our most important duty right now, even as we probably tell our friends and neighbors that these signs are pointing to the end, Watch unto prayer, for the great day of the Lord is at hand. The mark of the beast is exactly what it has been proclaimed to be. Not all in regard to this matter is yet understood, nor will it be understood until the unrolling of the scroll. And here is what I'm saying. And it's the author is in agreement. Many will look away from present duties, present comfort and blessings, and be borrowing trouble in regard to the future crisis. This will be making a time of trouble beforehand, and we will receive no grace for any such anticipated troubles. We can't afford to borrow troubles, and that's the point I was making just now, that even though we're supposed to be watching, even though we're supposed to be preparing, we shouldn't look for trouble where there's none. And again, I'm talking about internally. Notice what I said earlier when the Bible tells us that
to do this, we need to do that. And frankly, they scare the fellow Christians. But this shouldn't be. I tell you this. We're told, and we see always in history, that those who think that they're wiser than God, who know better than God, God has always and every time came off more than a conqueror. And so you think that, okay, well, I'm going to hold up some food, some water, whatever, some supplies, you know, and I'm going to hunger down and survive the crisis. My sisters, my brother, I tell you, if you think that we're going to be safe in our houses, with our possessions, we're sadly mistaken. Maybe your neighbor who doesn't have anything will come and rob yours. Maybe spies from those in power will come and confiscate what you have. Our dependence should never be on our own. And we have word in the scripture not to even worry about all those things. Again, the most important thing that we need to be doing at this time is to be in an attitude of prayerfulness. Prayerful watchfulness as we see these things taking place and get ready to take place in our world. There is a time of trouble coming to the people of God. But we are not to keep that constantly before the people and rein them up to have a time of trouble beforehand. There is to be a shaking among God's people, but this is not the present truth to carry to the churches. You hear that? And that's what many people are doing, actually. And so as you're listening to this, and for those of you who will be listening to the recording later on, understand this. We know all these things. We are aware of all these things. Many people are not. But the thing is, if they are not aware of who Jesus is, all these other things will scare and I'm praying that those of you who are listening would have a proper understanding of end time events and not just a superficial understanding. Not what you're being fed, but like we were told earlier, we need to study for ourselves. Again, yeah, and read it. Say, say it again. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to repeat my statement. It says, I have been shown many who will claim to be especially taught of God and will attempt to lead others. And from mistaken identity, they will undertake a work that God has never laid upon them. Confusion will be the result. Let everyone seek God most earnestly for himself that he may individually understand his will. That's what we're called actually to do, to tell every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, to seek God for yourself, to know the truth for yourself. We are called to be Boreans. So if I know something and I figure that you ought to know it, all I do is just present the evidence, the case before you, allow you to think for yourself, to reason for yourself, to understand for yourself, and then you do your own research. But my duty is not to scare you into let's form a union and let's form a band, a, a brotherhood, and let's survive this thing. Because truth be told, wherever we go, whatever we do, we will all be motivated. We can't afford to be that.
attitude of God's people. Picture when we see clearly all these things taking place. Oh, let me go and find my Bible. Let me go and search for this. Because truth is, there's going to be a famine in the land, and as the Bible says, it won't be about water. Probably water over there plenty. It won't be. of the golden morning are clearly seen. Let us embrace it as good news. Let us not be discouraged by what we see taking place in our families, in our churches, in our communities. Not to say not to worry about it in the sense of not doing anything to be salt and light. Not to close up shop on our Christianity. But to realize this, that it's not within our power as God. In a world who our hearts go out after and we love them and we want to see them in a scared panic mode. That's what Satan wants to do. He operates in chaos and confusion. The Bible says that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He operates in peace. He wants us to have peace. Not worry. Not fret. Okay, so we know that the Pope is coming in a couple of days. We know that shortly after that next week will be the last of the um, four blood moons. All right, we know all this, right? Okay, all of that None of that, okay, will cause us to be saved. It's our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so at the end of the day, that's what is most important. That's what we need to have. They would, like a flaming fireball, dear friends, the only thing that we have left standing is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I pray that each and every one of us will have a relationship with Jesus Christ as we approach our date with destiny. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. Thank you for being with us during this study. And I pray, dear God, that as we continue to serve you, as we continue to love you, Very, very special. Praise the Lord. Thank you. I just said in order to get it, it's not the cost. We can't convert anyone just to pray. And to see them here, they have to go to God. That's right. 